a good morning. And we want to welcome all of you and all of our friends and family watching online. Come on, can we show some love to our, all of our friends and family? We love you. Come on, you can do better than that. Welcome. So good to have you with us. And uh, so good to be with all of you this morning. Um, I had a little bit of a break last week as my wife brought the message, an incredible, prophetic, powerful message last week. If you weren't here, you'll want to uh, grab the podcast or uh, catch up on that um, on, on video, but it was a, a prophetic word for all of us, and uh, it ministered to me throughout this week, and I'm just so thankful for you, honey. I, I'm, I'm grateful that I get to go home with you every Sunday, and, um, and I have a I live with a woman of God, and I'm excited. God's good. And so, so I, I actually didn't take a break last week. I, um, after second service, I drove to Akron, where I preached at my dad's church in Akron. And this is pretty cool. I preached in Spanish. Isn't that awesome? Now, you might not think that's a big deal, but I, um, I don't normally preach in Spanish at my dad's church. We usually have a translator because um, conversational Spanish uh, comes fairly easy. Uh, but when you preach, the, the, you use some words uh, when you preach that you don't normally use in, con, in conversation. But, um, but I, I did it anyways, and it, it was my mom said I did pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, my dad's been in the hospital. Uh, many of you know that. Um, just an update on him. You know, he had to go in for a major procedure a few weeks ago uh, where they had to uh, amputate his leg just under the knee. Um, and so his biggest complaint while he was in the VA hospital in Cleveland was the, the food and that um, because of the restrictions, he couldn't see my mom. And so, but he is home now and he can't wait to preach. Um, eventually he'll have a prosthetic and he's going to continue to preach uh, and uh, continue to do what he does. But uh, we're here today and so thankful to be here today. Just a couple things uh, as we, uh, before we go into the message I uh, just want to let you guys know, some of you may already know this, but this Saturday, um, they're, they're, they're making this Saturday a National Day of Prayer for our nation. Now, that, this isn't a White House thing or a president thing. I, I believe it's just Christian leaders from across the nation that are calling the church uh, to return and to pray. And I know there's a big event, I believe, happening in D.C., but many communities, many churches are just gathering, whether it's in your home this Saturday um, or... Uh, we're making our prayer center just available any time on Saturday if you want to just come and uh, spend a moment in prayer just for our nation uh, because we believe as a church that America is not done with God and God is not done with America. And we know that prayer, prayer changes things. And so this Saturday, if you're available, um, whether it's praying from your home, uh, I'm sure there'll be people gathering throughout the day at the prayer center. We'd appreciate that. And then also want to make mention that if you could please mark your calendar to join us um, on October 18th, uh, that's a Sunday, Sunday evening, 6 p.m., we're going to be gathering here in the worship center as a church family on Sunday night, October 18th. And we're going to be gathering to not only spend time in worship and in prayer um, and in the presence of God, but really just uh, unpack uh, the season that we've been, uh, that we've gone through as a church, and also where we are and where we're going. And it's going to be an, uh, an, an important evening that uh, if you consider Victory Christian Center uh, your, your home, uh, then we want you to be a part of that. I want, I want you to know that God is moving. He really is. I tell you what, these last couple of weeks, um, and, and my wife and I and our staff, and even just this past weekend on Friday, um, the campus pastors, we were all able to come together to spend time together, and uh, God m stepped in. And he did some amazing things as we gathered together as brothers. And, and you're going to be seeing the fruit of that. We are excited. Um, what the enemy meant for evil, God is turning around for good. And you know who's going to lose? The devil is going to lose in this region. And he's going to lose big time. And so, um, and so we'll, we'll be sharing more of that. But um, I, I, am, I am more optimistic and excited about today and about our future than ever before, because you know why? Jesus always wins. Amen? Go ahead and just thank him for just a moment. And so I, I want to share with you, um, you know, I want to share with you a message, uh, and, and so if you can go ahead and turn to your Bibles to John chapter 2, uh, John chapter 2. If you're using a, using a paper Bible, turn to John 2. I'm just going to ask you to turn to one place in your Bible this morning. 
Um, there'll be just a couple more scriptures that I'll be sharing, but they'll all be up on the screen behind me. If uh, you're, you're using a smart device, then click on John chapter 2. We're going to be there uh, in just a moment. We're going to begin with verse 1. But um, uh, as we begin today's message, you know, um, one of the things that impresses me is I'm impressed with people. Uh, I'm impressed with people that that um, that kind of go against the grain. And uh, anyone here ever do Christmas in July or Christmas in the summertime? Like you, 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 you didn't wait for whatever reason. First service, we had a number of hands go up. I see some. Um, it's a little bit odd, but um, I'm impressed with people that do something like Christmas in July. You know, they didn't wait. Until December 25th, but for different reasons. Maybe you just like the holiday and you wanted to do it for fun. Maybe your kid was out serving in the military and they were only going to be home for a certain time. Or maybe family uh, that wouldn't be here for Christmas are here during the summer. And so you decided, instead of waiting for a future moment on the calendar, that you would celebrate now what others would be celebrating later. That's impressive. Uh, there's some people here that, that maybe a Thanksgiving meal is one of your favorite meals, and, and you don't wait till Thanksgiving. You know, you love turkey and, and mashed potatoes and stuffing and, and, and all the stuff that comes with it, the pumpkin pie, and, and you know what? You, you, you kind of buck all trends, and instead of waiting only once a year to partake of such scrumptious delights, you decide to eat it whenever you want, right? I mean, it's like, come over, we're having Thanksgiving dinner, and it's like February or, or June, and... and uh, and then there's some people that, uh, you know, you, your, your birthday, uh, and you don't have a birthday, you have a birth month. Your birthday isn't until September 30th, but you started celebrating September 1st, right? Because why wait, right? You're, you're, you're turning your t tomorrow into right now, into today. And, um, you know, th that, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, we, I don't think we've ever celebrated Christmas in July or had Thanksgiving dinner on Easter or anything like that. But, but my, my point is... As, as I was thinking about what to share on today, because I, I see God doing something. Uh, I know he's doing things in my life. He's doing things within our leadership and even in, in many, many of your lives. But, but it, it's like, I wonder, Lord, is it possible to pull into our day something that's reserved for another day? When it comes to our relationship with you, right, there are things that we're waiting for. I believe the countdown to Christmas started a few days ago. We're now less than 100 days away from Christmas. And there's a countdown. But the reason this message is important is because some of us are waiting for something more significant than just a holiday to occur. We're waiting for a breakthrough. We're waiting for a miracle. And so I, I wonder with God is, can we have Christmas in July? Can we, can we pull into the month of September and this month that we're, we're not even done with 2020 yet, we can't wait for 2021, but can we pull in some 2021 into this year? Can we pull in something that was reserved for another day into our now? And I began looking at scriptures and, and there's a story that I want us to look at in John chapter 2 because I believe the answer is absolutely yes. That as individuals, that as a church, that as a community, whether you're watching online or you're here in person, that there are some things that we're believing God for and we're already experiencing, that you may not have seen it, but we've experienced already some things that we've been able to pull into our day now that we thought was reserved for another day. And so let's look at John chapter 2 and uh, verse 1. And it's a story about a wedding in Cana. And the Bible says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. 
And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine, not until last. Jesus didn't save the best for last. He saved the best for, say that word, that last word, for? Now, come on, say it again like you believe God's getting ready to do something now. Say it. Now. He saved the best for now. And I want to look at for just a moment as we've read this story, the traditional historical things about this story that are not in the Bible that we think from history are true. Most theologians, for example, think that this is John's wedding, the Apostle John. If we know anything about John is that as he wrote his book, the book of John, that he, he kind of leaves his name out of the story. And when he talks about uh, events that occurred that he was in, for example, he just would say the disciple that Jesus loved. And so many theologians believe this was John's, actual John's wedding. And one of the reasons they believe that is because of the guests that were invited. The Bible says that Jesus and the disciples were invited. And Mary, Jesus' mother, was there too. Now, uh, historically, here's what we know, that John and Jesus are cousins. John's mother is Salome, who is Mary's sister. This also explains why, why Mary was so concerned about them running out of wine, right? I mean, it's, it's like any sister, when their sister's getting married, they're, they're often some of the ones that are making sure that everything is going well. This was her nephew, after all, and, and this caused her great concern. And one of the things that we know historically is that weddings in that day are unlike weddings today. Couples didn't get married and then that evening throw a reception and then leave for their honeymoon. No, their reception would last seven days. So the couple would get married, and this family would throw a feast, would throw a reception. For seven days, they would have to have enough food and enough wine to drink for the guests that would take off time from work and would travel from afar to celebrate this union, and they would gather for seven days. But the Bible says that on the third day, they ran out of wine. And Mary was concerned, and this was a big problem because this had such potential to bring shame and scandal to the family, that they would run out of wine on the third day, and they still had four days left to celebrate, and the shame, the scandal that, that would come. And so Mary took matters into her own hands, and she would turn to Jesus and say to Jesus, they ran out of wine. Now my question is, why would she do that? Why would she turn to Jesus and get him involved in this problem? Out of everyone in that room, I mean, she didn't, she didn't, you know, she, she didn't, she didn't say, hey, let's, let's run to the local winery or the or local uh, place where, where the fields of grapes are and, and let's get, he, she just turned to Jesus and, and, and pay, pretty much put the problem on him. We've run out of wine. Do something about it. Now, if you're like me, I read this story and I ask that question and, and I start getting a little bit as, I, as my uh, uh, holy imagination starts kind of wandering a little bit. I, 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 I found myself in a place of comedic conjecture where I, where I just started, you know, this probably didn't really happen, but maybe. That maybe one of the reasons Mary knew to go to Jesus is because after all, she was his mother. She was his mother. And, and, through, and throughout his growing up years, some interesting events occurred, and she knew something about Jesus. For some reason, she knew this would not be hard for Jesus. Maybe, maybe just maybe that when, when, when Jesus was a little boy and they'd be at family gatherings and all the kids would be swimming, maybe we would have to come to Jesus and say, now Jesus... Get down in the water and swim like the rest of the children. Maybe their, 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 their little dog, Fluffy, 
Jesus's and, and Mary's and their family's little dog Fluffy maybe got ran over by a chariot one day and all of Jesus's brothers and sisters are crying their eyes out because little Fluffy is laying dead in the middle of the road because a chariot ran it over and Mary's walking over to, you know, eight-year-old Jesus and saying, Jesus, can you take care of this? And Jesus is saying, mom, it's not my time. And Mary's saying, Let's do it. And Jesus is walking over to the road and he bends down and he's like, hey guys, he was just sleeping. Fluffy's not dead. He was just sleeping. He's okay. Right? Maybe, maybe while Jesus is doing homework one night, uh, Mary is, is calling out to Jesus and said, Jesus, I need you to run to the grocery store. We have no flour in the house. And maybe Jesus' response is like any typical teenager, mom, this is due tomorrow. I can't right now. I've got to finish this tonight. But son, if you want to eat, you've got to go to the grocery store and get some flour. And there is Jesus. He's just, okay, mom, look in the drawer again. Go ahead, just look in the drawer again. She knew something about Jesus enough to get him involved in this moment. She doesn't, the family, the, the wedding party, they run out of wine and there she is, and you've got the servants on one side, you've got Jesus on the other side, and Mary turns to Jesus and says, they've run out of wine. Typical woman style, by the way, right? It, it, in, in terms of, they don't come right out and say, you know, what it is she wants him to do. She just says, they've run out of wine. It's like when my wife says, we've run out of toilet paper. All that means to me is, thanks for the heads up. I'll go to the kitchen and grab some, uh, you know, some napkins. That's not what she means when, when she says we've run out of toilet paper, right? As guys, we don't know this. Women know that when you make that statement, she's not saying go to the kitchen and grab some napkins. She's saying get your butt to the store and buy some toilet paper. But in typical woman fashion, she just says we've run out of wine. Jesus responds, what does that have to do with me? My time has not yet come. And so she then turns to the servants and says, and says some of the most powerful words that, listen to me, are the key to any and every miracle you or I will ever experience. And that is this. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And we've read the rest of the story. But one of the things that's powerful about this story, Jesus said, it's not my time. Jesus said, now is not the moment. Jesus said, this isn't my moment. This is God telling a human. I know she was his mother, but this is God telling a human. A human that was placing a demand on God for something that was reserved for another day. And she was placing a demand on God on saying, not tomorrow, but now. And Mary pulled into her day something that was only available for another day. How does she do it? Point number one, it's time to know God. In other words, she did it because of relationship. She did it because of relationship. And I want to submit to you today that we are in a season, we are in a season where we are seeing, we saw it this week, we saw it throughout this week. We saw it in our staff. We saw it as we gather together as campus pastors. I've heard a testimony in this morning of a family experiencing this in their own family this week. We're in a season of miracles, and we're in a season where people that have relationship with God are putting a demand on him, and even something that was reserved for another day, they're able to pull it into the now simply because of relationship. And I want to believe for you, and I want to believe for me, and I want to believe for us and this region and even the nation. That there, yes, there may be some things that are reserved for another day. We keep hearing about a revival that's coming, and an outpouring that's coming, and an awakening that's coming. But I'm just about to say, why not here, why not now, and why not us? How, how did Mary get access to that? Listen, through relationship. It's time to know God. It's not, just, it's not enough to just know the ministry of God and the service of God and the activity of God. 
But at some point, we've got we've to know God for himself. We've got to know God intimately, have a relationship with him. Because I want to be one of the ones in this generation that the world may not be experiencing it. And maybe it was reserved for 10 or 20 or 50 years from now. But where are the ones that, like Mary, can pull into their day something that was reserved for another day? Well, Pastor Juan, that's just Mary. You don't see that in the rest of Scripture. Oh, I beg to disagree with you. Because David, King David, had a similar relationship with God. King David lived during a time where theologians describe it as the dispensation of law. In other words, he lived during a time where God and his people were, 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 the relationship was based around a lot of rules and regulations. In fact, there were some things that God has stated uh, to his people Israel. I mean, some, some very stringent things when it came to worship even. That if you did it the way that God said to do it, there'd be blessing. And if not, not only would there be cursing, but even death. One of those things was about about, um, about the, the bread in the temple at the altar. God would make it very clear that the only person allowed to touch that bread was the priest. Anyone else, if they touched it, would die. And we would see throughout the Old Testament that when people approached God... In their own manner and not in the, in the prescribed manner that God had given that they would die. In one case, it was fire coming down from heaven, not consuming the sacrifice, but consuming the one that came in wrong. And yet you would see David. I would read the story of David and think to myself, how in the world can he get away with this stuff? It's absolutely not fair. You see David one day. You see, David, one day, he's running from Saul, and he wants, he wants, to, he wants to get the, the, the sword of Goliath that's in the temple. And when he goes and grabs the sword, the Bible says he was hungry, and he went to the altar and grabbed the bread in the altar. Now, God said, if you do that, you'll die. David didn't die. Because through relationship, David was able to pull into that dispensation of law, a dispensation of grace. Something that was reserved for another day. Something that was reserved for not 10 years, but hundreds and even thousands of years later. He was able to tap in to God the Father and even the grace of God the Son in a moment of time where it wasn't available. But through relationship, he brought into his day, into now, Something that was reserved for another day. In more modern times, I'm reminded of a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. He is now in heaven, but Smith Wigglesworth was known as the, uh, the, uh, the apostle of faith. And God would use Smith Wigglesworth to do some of the most incredible miracles that you've ever heard of. One day he stood up in, in a meeting like this and he made this statement. And whenever I heard it, it just, it just floored me. Here's the statement he made. He said, if I'm speaking... In a room or in a place, and God isn't moving, I'll make him move. I remember reading that and thinking to myself, that's just some really bad theology. That's just wrong. I don't like that. And I started digging a little bit deeper only to understand that Smith Wigglesworth wasn't saying that, that God is just like a jukebox and he'll put a quarter in or rub him like a genie in the lap or like, or like he's God's boss. What Smith Wigglesworth was saying that I didn't understand was me and God have such a relationship that I make God move. Here's what I'm talking about. There's only one man in this room that can make this woman move. You can't make her move, but guess what? I can make her move. You know how? Through relationship. And in the same way she can make me move that no other woman no other lady no other girl can make me move she can make me move how through relationship and we have a God that desires the kind of intimacy though our people are crying out and believing that it's 10 years down the road 20 years down the road no baby God is saying I wish somebody would get me to move and pull me into their now because what's reserved for another day can be yours right now if you'd simply make me move Through relationship. It's through relationship. So it's time to know God. It's time time for this generation to know God. It's time for young people to know God. 
It's time for all of us to know God. It's time for the church to know God. We know religion. We know denomination. We know theology. We know doctrine. We know Bible. But do we know God? Do we know God enough to make him move? Do we know God enough to make him come? Do we know God enough to move in the now? And I thought about even the, the scripture and the story that, Je- that Deidre shared last, uh, last Sunday. When she talked about Jesus being called on to his friend's house in Bethany. His friend Lazarus was sick. And Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. And, and when Jesus got word, he waited for a couple of days before he came to Bethany. And when he finally came, it was too late. It was too late. Lazarus has already died and he was wrapped in grave clothes and already in a tomb for a number of days and the stone rolled over it. And when I heard that story, I thought about this message and I, and I thought about Mary's response and Martha's response because they're, they're the same kind of person but on, on, two, up and on two sides of a, of a coin. It, it's like they come at it from two different angles and, and here's what it is. Jesus shows up, and when Jesus shows up and Lazarus already dead, in John eleven thirty two, 32, the Bible says that Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, and she fell at his feet. And here, here was her statement. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Did you catch that? She said, if you would have been here. In other words, she had faith for yesterday. She looked back, and she had faith for yesterday. But then Martha came. On the other side, and in verses 24 and 25, in verse 24, Martha says, oh, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Do you see the two, the two bookends here? Mary is coming to Jesus and said, if you would have been here yesterday, my brother wouldn't have died. Martha's saying, oh, I know, it's okay. Tomorrow, on the last day, down the road, sometime later, he'll be brought up to life. And Jesus' response to those who believed him for yesterday and it never happened, and those that are still holding on for tomorrow, Jesus' response to Mary was, Mary, I'm not the great I used to be, and Martha, I'm not the great I'm going to be. I am. I am right now in this moment here. And because of relationship, I can do something that was reserved for another day and something that you thought I should have done yesterday. I am here right now because you've brought me here and I'm here and now is the moment for your miracle and your breakthrough. Do you believe that what you've been believing God for and what you thought was already past, God can do now? And so number two, now is the time. Now is the time, and I put a blank there because for everybody it's different. Now is the time. You fill in the blank because for you it's different than it is for me. There's something that you're believing God for, something that we're believing God for. And whatever it is, you're believing God for it. And some of you look backwards and you feel like it's just too late. You feel like the window of opportunity for God has already come and it's gone. For your marriage, for your family, for your finances, for your health. It's too far gone. The report is too bad. The relationship is too severed. It's dead. And like last week's message, it's dead and buried and wrapped in a tomb. And we don't even want to uncover it because if we do, it stinks. Or maybe you were leaving God for something in the future. And we're, we're often people that either live in the past or we live in the future, not realizing that we serve a now God. And I've got news for you that, yes, we can hold on and believe God that tomorrow our children will come back to God. Or tomorrow we'll get the good doctor's report. Or tomorrow we'll have that financial breakthrough that we've been believing God for. Or tomorrow God will move in our city. Or tomorrow revival will come. Or tomorrow an outpouring, an awakening would come. But how many people understand that there are some things that cannot wait till morning. Yes, weeping endures for the night and joy comes in the morning but God, there are some things that cannot wait till the morning. We want to place a demand on God and through relationship, pull into now something that was reserved for another day. In this moment, now, can you see that woman as she's a silent shadow stepping over Lounging, sleeping, disciples. 
And she's carrying an alabaster box. And she kneels down at the feet of Jesus and she breaks it open and begins to pour a year's wages of precious ointment on his feet. And Jesus would say that wherever the gospel is preached, I want you to tell them about a woman who anointed me for burial. And within 24 hours, he would be hanging on a cross. Something in her said, I can't wait. It has to happen now. I must break it open now. I must bring God my everything and my all now. Something in her said, it's now or never. Something in her said, if I'm ever going to pour out my life, I better do it now. If I'm ever going to, ever going to give my best, I better do it now. If I'm ever going to give what I have, my resources, my life, I better do it now. If I'm ever going to make a difference, I better do it now. If I'm ever going to do something for the body of Christ, if I'm ever going to pursue or press in, I've got to do it now because there are things that are at stake and we can't wait for tomorrow. God, we need the miracle now. And we've got to quit putting off. We've got to quit putting off something that we can bring into our now. Are you hearing this? Are you getting this? That through relationship. We can pull into our day something that was reserved for another day through relationship. Not realizing that often God is at work and God is moving. Many of us, if you're like me, you, you, can't, you can't wait till December 31st, 1159 p.m. You can't wait until that moment on the calendar that waves goodbye to 2020 and welcomes in the new year of 2021. I'm already planning. I've already got vision. I'm already praying, and I can't wait for 2021. I'm looking at the calendar, and it can't get here fast enough. But what if, what if there's, there's a whole other place in God where if you really hear what he's saying through relationship like Mary You could say, hey, we've run out of wine. Wait a minute. It's not 2021 yet. Let's just get through this year. Let's just just lick our wounds and let's just back up a little bit. We're going to have to wait because 2020 is done. It's a scrap year. What is it if like Mary, if like David, if like Wigglesworth, if like others in scripture that pulled into their day, something reserved for another day. What if, what if through relationship we could say, yeah, God, but I, I want to have, have Christmas in July. I want a new year, not on January 1, but how about we start getting some 2021 in September of 2020? How about we start moving into, into this new, and see, and see what you've got to understand, we've, we've, in this week alone, this week alone, there's been, there's been miracle after miracle throughout this week. Things that I thought were impossible. Things that I thought, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. But I don't even know. I, don't, I know we can't do it. I know I can't do it. And we saw God move. And I told you a little bit earlier on as we began this message that this past Friday, we had an incredible gathering with our campus pastors. And it, wasn't, it, it was important that we were all together, but it was more important that Jesus was there. And see, what, what you may not understand about the significance of that moment and that day on Friday, this past Friday, that while we're waiting for 2021, we're waiting for tomorrow, this past Friday was significant. Not because of what happened behind closed doors in, a, in, a, in, in, in the Warren campus with us, with us guys as we met with Jesus and God would do a miracle and meet with us, but what we realized on that day was that it was on the Jewish calendar the new year. The festival is called Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish new year that started on Friday at sundown and ends tonight at sundown. What if I told you that today is a new year? What if I told you that what you were waiting for to come about a hundred days from now is already here? You know why? Because Jesus is the great I am, not the great I'm going to be. And you don't have to wait for a new year to experience new breakthroughs and new miracles and new beginnings. God can do right now what we were believing God for tomorrow. What 
Well, we, we've got to wait for the conference next year. We, we've got to wait for the evangelists to come. We've got to wait for, 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 the, for the, the guy that, that God uses in healing to come. And yet we don't understand that Jesus is an evangelist, he's a healer, he's a redeemer, he's a savior, he's the deliverer. That when you get Jesus, you get everything. You don't need it, you, you just need him. He shows up and whatever he asks you to do, you just do it. And when you do, that is the key to the breakthrough and the miracle. These miracles didn't happen by accident, but it happened as people were saying, God, what do you want me to do? It doesn't sound cool, it doesn't sound possible, okay, but I'll do it. And when you do it, God does the miracle. I guess I stopped by to tell you this morning something that you were waiting to hear on December 31st or that last Sunday of this year. I have stopped by to tell you, Happy New Year. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. For behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not perceive it? Our next is now. Our next is now. Our next is now. Our next is now. And I want to pursue God in relationship. I want to place a demand on God. Out of relationship. I want to place a demand that says there's too much at stake. There's too much at stake in this day in our generation. And I just don't want to be people that pray for a move of God for the next 20 years. But like Mary and like David, find the secret to pull into our day something reserved for another day. Because some things cannot wait until tomorrow. We need revival now. We need awakening now. We need an outpouring now. Somebody needs healed today. Not tomorrow, today. Somebody needs restored and rescued and delivered and set free today. And it's possible. Why? Because when God is not moving, I can make him move because he's my dad. He's my friend. And I just say, Jesus, come. And he moves in your life and in my life. We need him now more than ever. And while we're waiting for a calendar to dictate to us what you can celebrate, God is saying, if you tuned into my calendar, your new year already started. I've already started working behind the scenes, and you have access now on earth as it is in heaven. Well, pastor, you know, I'll just wait to heaven to become whole and to become you. I'll just wait to heaven until he can wipe away every tear and deal with my depression and deal with my anxiety. You don't have to wait to experience heaven when you get to heaven. You can experience heaven here on earth because God wants us to bring heaven to earth. His will be done. His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but now. Come on, stand to your feet for just a moment. Stand to your feet. How many are feeling this right now? I don't know why Jesus, in the story of Lazarus, I don't, I don't know why he didn't just get up and go when he was summoned. But what I do know about God is that God often allows the process to play out. Because what he's often is looking for is agreement, is to, for someone to come into agreement with heaven. You see, we often think that when we pray and we don't see it now, that for some reason it's just somewhere down the road. And yet I read in the book of Daniel whenever he got down and he began praying. And for days and days and days and days and weeks would go by. And he thought that God was delayed in his answer until the answer showed up. And the answer showed up in the form of an angel. And when Daniel said, what took you so long? The angel said, are you kidding me? God activated us the moment you knelt down and you began to pray. The answer was already sent. We were on our way, but there was a delay. There was something happening between your prayer and and God's yes to your prayer. And we were delayed. The Bible says that that angel, the delay, 
was a demonic power, a prince. The Bible calls it a prince of Persia, which means a demonic power over the nation of Persia that pushed back the angel with the answer. But Daniel kept praying. He kept praying. And when the answer arrived, my point is, is there are things that we've been believing God for that God has already said, yes, it's on his way. But I want to declare over each and every one of you and over this church and over this region, we come against every principality, every power, and every ruler that is holding back God's yes. We say you have no power. We say in Jesus' name that we don't have Mary faith for yesterday. And we don't have Martha faith for tomorrow. We've got Jesus faith for now. You're the great I am and we're believing you for healing now. Restoration now. Recovery now. Healing now. Forgiveness now. Sons and daughters coming back home now in Jesus' name. All over this place, those watching online, in Jesus' name, let's pull into this day. Things reserved for another day. Pull it into our day. Go ahead, church, and just take a moment and just press into this. Yay, go! Happy New Year. It's a new year. It's a new year. The Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. It's a feast of trumpets. It's a feast of trumpets. It's it's the it's the shofar. That blows. What's significant about trumpets, biblically, and with Jewish people, is that the trumpet always signified God coming down, the presence of God. When God met with Moses on Mount Sinai, the people heard the sounds of a trumpet. And throughout scriptures, moments like that. Whenever the walls of Jericho, they were marching around, what happened? They blew the trumpet, and when the trumpet blast blew, the walls of Jericho came down. Why? Because God showed up and gave his people a victory. Now! What would happen? It's it's, it's a festival that prophetically speaks of the second coming of Christ. God coming down. Where the Bible says that at the trumpet sound. And Paul would say in Romans that now is high time to awake. Why? Because your redemption is nearer than when you first believed. And the second coming of Christ, like the new year, like Rosh Hashanah, like God coming down on Mount Sinai, like God coming down and knocking down the walls of Jericho, the blast of the trumpets when an angel stands at the four corners of heaven and begin to blow a trumpet that's heard across the four corners of the earth, the sky will crack open and Jesus, the Son of God, will come down. <laughs> From the first service, I wish we had some of them shofar people in the church. We're, we're always saying, shh, that's for, that's, for another, that's, for, that's for the special services. But man, if you can hear the trumpets are blowing and God is coming down to victory, Christian Center, raise your voice like a trumpet. Raise your voice like a trumpet. God is coming down. God is here. Not tomorrow. Not in 2021. But now. (laughs) Now. Hallelujah. Father, we lean into this moment. God, and as a church, we want to be like Mary. That through intimacy and relationship, we can pull into our day something that was reserved for another day. 
that like David, through relationship, we can live in a in this moment of time that contradicts the moment that we're living in. And Lord, not for us, not just for us, but Lord, for those around us, for every son and daughter that has backslidden, every son and daughter that has turned from you. God, for the next generation and for this generation, for the lost and the God confused, for the broken and the hurting and the desperate and the addicted, for the abused and the lost and the angry, for the hateful. God, for the sake of this region and this nation. Lord, we want to be ones that press in and that pull you down. In this moment, oh God, we don't want to just pray for revival. We want to be one. We want to be an awakening. We want to be an outpouring. We want to be healing in our region. We want to be healing. We want to be deliverance. We want to be freedom. We want you to come. And we thank you, God, that while many wait until December 31st to bring in the new year, Lord, we started bringing it in on Friday. It's a new year. It's a new season. It's a new era. And we will be a now people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. As Pastor Lucas comes and gives you some instruction, listen, remember. The Lord your God, he wins victory after victory. He's always with you. He celebrates and he sings because of you. And he will refresh your life with his love. Have an amazing week. God bless you.